Hi, Gemma. Hi, Marika. Thank you so much. Uh, yeah, we're really thrilled to be here. Uh, first, just a couple of brief introductions from ourselves. Uh, my name is Gemma Lampkin. I'm a senior research consultant here at SCIMS Research Services Division. And my specialty is within the healthcare market where I've worked for about eight years. Uh, specifically, I have a focus on medical devices, which is the part that I'll be speaking about today. And I'm also thrilled to be here with Paolo Cordella, and Paolo will introduce himself. Hello, hi. Um, this is Paolo. Um, I work in the same division as Gemma. It's uh, RSS. I'm a uh, research consultant for Scheme for about three years now. And I'm uh, specialized in choice modeling and therefore conjoins methods. And I'm happy to be here today with this webinar, which is about MBC and the medical device. And I pass the word to Gemma. Great. Thank you, Paolo. Uh, so the focus of the webinar today is really at the intersection of two areas of expertise for SCIM, choice modeling, which Paolo will speak about, and medical devices. Uh, just to uh, go through a brief agenda, obviously we've introduced ourselves. First, we'll spend some time talking about the medical device market dynamics, so some changes and evolution that we've seen over the past couple of years. Uh, later, we'll move on to more of the methodological side of things, which uh, will introduce menu-based conjoint, or MVC, as we call it. And then hopefully we'll have enough time to wrap up and answer any questions that you might have. So as Marika mentioned, please feel free to send those via the chat. Okay, so let's just take a look at the medical device market. Uh, at Skim, we typically work with medical device companies in three key areas. Uh, so marketing and communication, so more of the value proposition kind of thinking or claims work. Uh, we also work quite a bit in feature prioritization and product development, so more from the R&D perspective in terms of scoping and developing new products or devices. And then also within pricing and portfolio optimization. So as you get nearer to market, what would be the optimal pricing for your medical devices and how do you optimize the portfolios that you already have. The work that we also do uh, is sort of spans three areas of devices. So they can be small devices, which is more like blood glucose monitors or uh, personal blood pressure monitoring machines. Uh, they can be more of the mid-scale as far as purchasing goes, so um, defibrillators or um, smaller ultrasound devices, and all the way up to large devices, or so more of the capital equipment expenditures. That could be MRI machines, CT scanners, any really large-scale purchase for a hospital or organization. And so before we really dive into um, the MBC part of things today, I think it's important to first take a look at the medical device market and some of the challenges that we've been experiencing over the past few years. Uh, so one challenge, which is obviously not too particular to this industry and what we see everywhere, is fierce competition. So it's getting harder and harder for medical device companies to maintain a leading position in the industry. Uh, there's more and more pressure to really stay on top, and competition is quite intense. And with that, there's increased pressure to innovate and offer new and really more exciting solutions. So R&D teams are feeling more and more pressure uh, to produce better products, newer features, and what we often refer to as killer features. With that, there's also the pressure to prove the value or the benefit of products to end users and buyers. So it's really not enough for R&D to develop these features and these cool products, but customers really have to understand what the value is to them. How is it going to help them in the hospital or in their practice? How will it save them time or money? Really, what is it going to do for them? And lastly, of course, leading to that, you see that we really have to provide more value at lower price points. So with this increased competition and the increased need to show value, you also still have to do it all at a reasonable cost. So there's quite a lot of pressure on the industry and on R&D to accomplish these goals. To maintain a leading position in the industry, you really have to have targeted approaches from all sides. So one is your pricing strategy really just coming to the market, offering the right price, and offering a competitive price. Uh, the other is p positioning. So in order to command really a reasonable price point, you have to really be uh, talking to people and showing the value in the right way. 
And that ladders up all the way to proving the product and the feature value. So you have to show value, and it has to be on the product and the feature level. What we also see is that there's a shift towards customization. So it used to be that um, at the purchase point for medical devices, it was really more all about fully configured devices. So I would pick my ultrasound or I would pick my CT scanner, and the customer really didn't have a lot of input as to what that final device looks like. Now we have a shift more towards customer configured devices. So the customer is really much more involved in the decision making as far as what the end product looks like. Um, so they can pick their features, they can exclude features, and they're really yeah, much more involved in the end result. So as I said, you have more involvement from the customer, and we're going to touch on two examples today. In the first example, the customer can really customize their medical device at the purchase, so selecting which features they need in order to end up with their desired package. So basically what goes in, what goes out to end up with the end product. In the second example, the customer can add on extra solutions or features to a basic solution. So these could be extra items like an additional warranty or a service package or perhaps a second monitor or screen. And so they can basically add on to the initial base product additional solutions and offerings. And because of what we see in the market and these challenges and changes, it really becomes very important to know the value of your features. So um, we have this challenge to develop innovative features, and of course that costs money. Uh, costs money uh, from the innovation standpoint and also from a manufacturing standpoint. And we have to determine whether the features offer enough value to customers to justify a price premium. So it's really crucial to understand price sensitivity at the feature level and to identify any price barriers that there might be in the market for that feature uh, in order to understand whether it's um, yeah, justified to pursue the development of such features in your device. So just to sort of recount before I hand it over to Paolo to talk about yeah, what we do with all of these great problems. Uh, the first is the increased involvement of the customer in what is going in or out of the product. So again, customizing either at the purchase or adding on these other solutions. And the second is the focus on understanding the price premium associated with innovative or killer features. So in other words, justifying the development and value of specific features within the product. And with that, I'm going to hand it over to Paolo, who will talk more about the methodology. Thank you, Gemma. Um, this sounds to be a lot of questions to answer <laughs> from, uh, for, a, for a methodology, but that's why we are here today. Um, I will start from an example from just a generic uh, device, let's see, it's a defibrillator, and the main business question, as Gemma said, is this product will have a, so, um, some optional feature to add on top of the base product. And the question of the of, and the business question is which one of those do we want to bring in the in the in the market and what will be the price for that? So what's the additional solution to offer to the clients? Um, this can be, for example, a, fe a feature of the product like a video display or a or a ergonomic pad, or can be a, a service like an external warranty on a training or a support, and this could work in any other type of markets, like, I don't know, in the car in industry, insurance market, fast food market. You can think of uh, many other situations like this. So the standard way of solving this type of problem would be with a conjoint analysis. And today we are going to go quickly through an evolution of conjoint and see what are the difference between the three main conjoint methods and what is this menu-based conjoint? So we would start from a CBC, which is choice-based conjoint. Some of you might be familiar with it, some of you might not. So let's go quickly through through it. Um, with 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 conjoints, re, uh, the respondents they have to make a single choice between a set of products. For, for example, there are three products on the screen and the respondent has to make a choice between three, uh, one of them. So I see the different fe uh, 
features. Some of them are in product one and some of them are, are in product two. And there is a total price for that. Now let's keep in mind this particular of the total price because that's a crucial di uh, difference be between the methods. So with the CVC, I make a single choice. So let's say that I, cho that I choose product one because I like those features and I like this price. Then we ask him a different scenario where we change the product configuration so they have a different feature combination. And now my choice is going to change be, uh, because I might go for product three now. So we collect all this information and we build our model for that where we can estimate what are the preferences of respondents for these features and the total price. However, there is a problem because we are observing now the, pre the preferences for the overall product and for the total price. So we don't have a clear view of what is actually the price elasticity for the single feature and what if a respondent he doesn't like one of the features. So what if I don't like the video display or what if I really like one and I want it always in my product. We cannot have this type of solution here. That's why the evolution of conjoint brought to an ACBC, which is, is a, an adaptive choice-based conjoint. So we, the, the way it uh, works, we first ask respondents to tell us w what are their favorite features or options. For example, I like the, I don't like the video uh, displays, but I like all the other three. So this is going to be my choice. Then we ask him a sort of a CBC, so a normal conjoint, without one of the attributes. The advantage of this is that my preference towards the video display is clear. I don't want it, so we don't need to catch my preferences for video display. So I go to a CBC where I still have to make a single choice between product one, two, or three. And let's say I choose product three, uh, two. And then we ask the respondent different scenarios and still we see how the choice is going to change. So now we have a more information at the feature level. So we know which one I like and which one I don't like or which one I always want on my product. However, we still I wish we are still working with total prices, so we observe an overall total price for the product, so we don't have a granularity at a single price item level. That's why we come up with the menu-based content. It's not we, it's like a methodology which is on the market now for about 20 years, but the news now is that we can actually model single choices at an, at an individual level by asking re respondent to make their own choice. So it, this is a free choice of all the features that we saw before with a single individual price for each of the features. So the key difference here between the CBC is that with the CBC we ask all questions. So would I like product one or two? In this case we are asking do you like feature A and feature B and feature C, so I can add on top of uh, the base product as many features as I want. And there is a, uh, an individual price for each of the features. So I can build your own my best configuration of the product and I can say whether I will buy the overall product or not and if I buy it, which feature I would add on top of it. So let's say that I select, as previously, I select the three option and I don't select video display. I see a total price now, but th this total price is simply telling me what is the sum of the items that I am choosing. So we can test different price scenarios. We will change the prices and we will see how my choice is going to change when I change pr prices. But also we will test different product offering scenarios. So, so we can test w what happens if I don't have on the screen some of the feature. For example, now I don't have the 24 hours support and what is going to happen now? 
So we collect all this, all this information on a, on a feature level as well on an individual price level for each of the features. So we can build up a model that can predict, so we can estimate what is the take-up rate, so what are the probability of choosing each of the features, giving a price that we can control. So our control variable is price, so we can change price and see how the movements of the take-up rates will be. So one of the main takeaways of this model is that we can identify what are the cross effects between the features. So let's assume that I will decrease the price of feature A. I go down from $50 to $40. What I can see, I can see how the take-up rates are changing and I can see that there is an interaction between the price of feature A and the take-up rate of, of feature B. So if I lower the price of feature A, I gain share for feature A by the lose share for feature B. This will tell us, can give us some information on the complementarity between the feature as well as some substitution effect between the, the, the feature. Also, we can simulate a, a, a lot of things like we can simulate, for, for example, what would happen if I launch a new feature in the market. So let's say now I have a CPR coaching. What is going to happen is going to cannibalize my current offering. Is my penetration rate going up or down? I can check those type of situation. I can also identify killer features. So what if I remove this feature from the, from the market? Am I going to lose overall shares or not? Am I going to gain share or not? I can optimize my product offering. So I can say those four features are the optimal feature that will maximize my overall share or not. And therefore, I can also optimize the products of my feature, the price of my feature. I can find what are the optimal prices that will maximize, for example, my revenue or my profit if I have some cost measures. So in a nutshell, what are the takeaways of MBC? We've seen a price elasticity analysis and the consequence of a revenue optimization. I can also optimize my product offering and I can see which feature should I bundle and which not. And one other thing that I didn't mention be, uh, before is that we can have a segmentation analysis and that's because we have uh, information of the probabilities at an individual of each respondent so we can segment the population according to different methods and we can see how the preferences are different between the different segments. And that's something that I think Gemma would be interested to have to deliver to clients and now I pass the word to Gemma. Thank you, Paolo. So just to wrap up in terms of what we've looked at today. So yeah, what is the so what? We have an evolving market, the medical device market, which has been changing and evolving over quite some time now. And what does that entail? We have pressure for innovative features. So R&D obviously has a lot of pressure to uh, produce more exciting and better options for customers. We have uh, increased involvement of the customer in terms of what features are going in or out. So in other words, more customization from the customer. And with that, we have this need to understand the price premium at the feature level to justify the feature development and value. So a justification is needed. And so with MBC, now we can accomplish several things. We can determine whether innovative features do have enough value to customers in order to demand a price premium. And we do that because we have the price sensitivity at the feature level. We can obtain a more realistic measure of the purchase intent for specific features, even when they're offered optionally to the customer. Uh, and we do that because we see now that there's more customization from the customer in the market. And as Paolo showed you in the MBC tasks, the customers or the respondents, of course, in market research, can also customize on the screen. We can understand how the purchase intent that we see will change when we change prices. So by varying the prices at the feature level, we'll understand how choices change and also between features, as Paolo showed us. 
and also that we can identify the optimal price points by optimizing revenue and profit. So if we have our manufacturing costs available and we know what it will entail, we can really do a lot of optimizations uh, to end up with the uh, yeah, final solution. So with that, Paolo and I would like to thank you so much for joining us. Uh, I think we still may have some time for questions, so I will pass it back to Marika, and we really appreciate you joining us. Thanks, Gemma. Thank you, Paolo. Uh, indeed, we still have some time for questions. Um, let me have a look. So the first question, how do you deal with the fact that many hospitals have very strict budgets for devices? Um, for example, there could be a budget limitation dedicated by the hospital that says that the customer will not exceed a budget. How will you deal with that? Okay, that's an interesting question because actually budget issues are coming over n not only in the in the medical device in industry, they are always in for car market or in a any type of market. So when it comes about budget constraints, we can incorporate those this information in our models. Basically, we can have this information upfront from the client or doing a questionnaire we can ask what's the budget or we can actually check what's the maximum amount spent during the exercise. Um, this information we can incorporate it in a simulation level to um, let's say to calibrate share to account for budget constraints so we for example sometimes we don't assign a share if the total price of the product is about the budget of a, at, a, at, an, at an individual level. The nice thing of the MDC now is, is that we have the shares at an individual level so we can use budget information also at an individual level. Thank you. And then we have another question. What kind of inputs do you need from a client to run a study like this? Hmm. Uh, <laughs> First uh, quotation. No. Um, so what we need from the from the client is first of all, yeah, the the list of attributes and especially the price. What we see from the client side is that it's always deep, uh, difficult to come up with the proper prices to be tested because that's actually sometimes the, the business question: what should be the price? But we we need the price range to test, and that's crucial because the price range that we test that we test will tell us where the willingness to pay of consumer is. And if the price range is not big enough, sometimes we cannot catch this. So this is something that should come out from a market knowledge. So that's something that maybe sometimes the client, they know what price range they want to test. And sometimes they know whether they, they, if they want to test the price increase so we can take into, into account uh, some, ter some type of price range or vice versa. So it really d depends from context to context, but that's one of the main information that, that we need. Okay, thank you, Paolo. Um, then there's another question. Um, actually, there's not. Um, this person will email them to you. So um, for information for all the other people that are listening in, it's also fine to contact us afterwards if you have any additional questions or you want to have a chat with one of our presenters. Um, I want to thank you all again for joining us for our webinar today. Um, please be sure to visit our website, skimgroup.com slash webinars, uh, where you can download this presentation and get information about our upcoming webinars. On behalf of Gemma, Paolo, and myself, I thank you once again, and we look forward to hearing from you soon. <laughs>